And now allow me to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Father Eduardo Montemayor is the former Associate Director of Evangelization and Hispanic Ministry for the Archdiocese of Detroit. He's a member of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, SOT. Now at residence at Most Holy Trinity Parish in Phoenix, Father Eduardo has visited the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in numerous occasions over the years. The apparition of Our Lady in Mexico City is one of his specialties. He is a bilingual and truly bicultural priest with a great passion and devotion for Our Lady of Guadalupe. He is tonight's keynote speaker and a nar and narrator as we recount the miracle of Tepeyac. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Father Eduardo Montemayor by typing a comment on the chat box or if you're on Facebook, uh, commenting on the live stream. Father Eduardo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christopher. Are you all able to hear me okay? Yes, Father, we can hear you and see your slides. Excellent. And you can see the slides. Perfect. Let me just... Um... Okay, perfect. Well, thank you once again, Christopher, and happy birthday. Wow, what an amazing gift to be born on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Fantastic. Welcome once again to everybody to this retelling of the miracle of Tepeyac, which occurred 489 years ago today. You permit me to first take you on a brief yet very dramatic overview of the historical context for this divine intervention. In the year 14, in the year 1474 AD, the future Juan Diego was born near the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan in what is today downtown Mexico City. His Aztec name was Cuacuatlatuatzin, really difficult to pronounce, which means speaking evil. And uh, when Juan Diego, or when Speaking Eagle was only 13 years old, an immense new temple pyramid was consecrated at Tenochtitlan in December 1487. And, on, and at the top of this shrine, it had two shrines, one to the sun god and the other to the rain god. Don Fernando de Alba, historian from from that period of time wrote that the Aztecs or Mexica carried out ritual human sacrifices on a scale never seen before in human history. It is estimated that more than 80,000 men were sacrificed within a few days for that dedication. To get a sense of the unimaginable horror, I want you to check out briefly a scene from the movie Apocalypto. Check this out. Aztecs have developed a very complex religious cosmology, worshiping the heavenly bodies. Let me brief you, briefly summarize their beliefs there before you could see the sun god on the left, I mean, on the, the rain god on the left and the sun god on the right. The Aztecs basically had two sets of gods fighting against each other, the earth and the sun against the moon and the stars. And they believed that the sun god created human beings, thus human beings, us, were, cons were considered to be children of the sun god. Yet every evening, the moon and the stars killed the sun god, and that's why darkness comes over the earth. The Aztecs believed that their human sacrifices were efficacious at causing the sun god to come back to life and to start a new day. And this same fight between the moon and the stars against the sun and the earth was repeated literally every day. This is the reason the Aztecs offered human sacrifices every day so that the sun would come back to life. And, and when it wouldn't rain, the Aztecs would also sacrifice some of their children to the god of rain, begging for rain upon their crops. It is estimated that one of every five Aztec children were sacrificed. I mean, can you imagine that? Their theology was one of fear and despair and whatever moral aversion they may have had 
his human sacrifices, their fear and despair made them feel that they had no choice but to practice it. Today, the dynamics behind, for example, abortion are essentially the same. Now, the future Juan Diego, speaking eagle, would have seen all of this. Yet his life was about to change forever. When Speaking Eagle was about 45 years old, Hernán Cortés and his men arrived in Tenochtitlan on November the 8th, 1519. And they first were peacefully received by Montezuma and were actually given gifts, but war soon broke out. By July 1520, Montezuma was killed. And in August of 1521, their new ruler, Cuauhtémoc, was captured. And Cortes renamed Tenochtitlan Mexico City. And this great Aztec city was defeated militarily, economically, and spiritually. It was reduced to poverty, to despair, and to death. That same year, their human sacrifices were ended. Their temple was destroyed. And, and you know what? The sun still kept coming out every morning. And the rain still kept watering their crops. And they realized that all these sacrifices had been meaningless. That You mean I sacrificed my child for nothing? And tremendous despair came upon them. And many of them committed suicide. Now, by 1523, Franciscan missionaries arrived and began to evangelize the native population. And one year later, in 1524, Speaking Eagle was baptized Juan Diego along with his wife, Maria Lucia and his uncle Juan Bernardino. And three years later, in 1528, the Diocese of Mexico City was formally established with a Franciscan bishop, Fray Juan de Sumarraga. Yet the bishop found a dire situation. The Spaniards, many corrupt, had enslaved many indigenous people, including young girls that they used as sex slaves. 50% of the indigenous population had died now by now from the smallpox. And many others, like I said, committed suicide. When the bishop confronted the local Spanish authorities, they threatened his life. And one time they even tried to assassinate him. Faced with these dire circumstances, on August 27, 1529, Bishop Sumarraga wrote a prophetic letter to the King of Spain, Carlos V, and I quote, I think it well to inform your majesty of what is happening now because it is something that is so important that if God does not provide a remedy from his hand, this land is about to be totally lost. You know, sometimes I feel that our country or our culture here in America has been totally lost, not unlike Bishop Sumarga. Now, one year, and four months later, God intervened in a most miraculous way. Early in the morning, on Saturday, December the 9th, 1531, Juan Diego was headed to Mass. And as he walked near Tepiak Hill, he began to hear beautiful music. And he saw a beautiful lady who called his name something like this. Juanito, Juan Dieguito. And he approached her and introduced herself by saying this. No facility, least of my sons, but I am the Virgin Mary Mother of the true God Through whom everything lives The Lord of all things near and far The Master of heaven and earth And she continued it is my earnest wish, Juan Diego, that a temple be built here to my honor. 
Here I will demonstrate, here I will manifest. I will give all of my love, my compassion, my help, and my protection to the people. She knew what they needed. She then asked Juan Diego to go to the bishop with her request. And Juan Diego, overwhelmed with joy, left to the bishop's residence. It, it took a long time to finally see the bishop. And, and when he did, the bishop kindly blew him off. Come back some other time when I have more time to listen to you carefully. Now Juan Diego went back to Tepeyac that same day and met with Our Lady once again. This was the second apparition. And he basically said, my lady, I did what you asked me to do, but it didn't work. Please send someone more important than me that the bishop may believe. And, and she responded so beautifully, my littlest one, it is necessary that it be you who act as spokesman on this matter. And I ask you to go once again tomorrow to see the bishop on my behalf. Notice that you chose the most little one. She didn't chose the smartest one or the richest one or the most important one, my littlest one. It is necessary to be you. And Juan Diego basically said, okay, I'll give it another try tomorrow after I go to mass on Sunday. And then on Sunday, December the 10th, 1531, Juan Diego went to mass and he went from mass straight to the bishop's residence. Yet the bishop didn't believe him. And he, and he said, basically said, Juan Diego, for me to believe all this, I need a sign. Ask her for a sign. And so Juan Diego agreed to ask Our Lady for a sign. His plan was to see her the following day on December 11th. So Juan Diego went home, but he found that his uncle, Juan Bernardino, was very sick with the plague, the smallpox. Viruela in Spanish. And in his wife, had recently died of it already in 1521. And now Juan Diego was afraid that his uncle would also die. So Juan Diego stayed home to care for his uncle. And he didn't go see Our Lady the next day on December 11th, caring for his uncle. You see, he had a very strong sense of family. His uncle kept getting worse though. And that night he urged Juan Diego to go early the next morning to call a priest to hear his confession and prepare him for death. And so on Tuesday, December the 12th, 1531, today, very early in the morning, Juan Diego started walking to call a priest. And as he approached Tepeyac Hill, he thought to himself, I don't have time to meet with the Virgin Mary. So he took another route to avoid Our Lady. But Our Lady intercepted him at the pass and said, my littlest one, where are you going? Whom are you off to see? This was the third apparition of Our Lady. And Juan Diego was very embarrassed and basically said, please forgive me, but my uncle is dying and I need to bring a priest to prepare, prepare him for death. And I promise that tomorrow, without fail, I will return and do exactly as you want. And then Our Lady said the most beautiful words, my littlest one, knowing your heart, that nothing at all should frighten or trouble you. Do not be afraid of this illness or any other illness. Am I not here who am your mother? Do not let your, uncle Ill, your uncle's illness trouble you. He is not going to die of it. Be assured in your heart that he has already been healed. And Juan Diego later found out that he was healed. Our Lady then promised to give Juan Diego a sign to take to the bishop at that very moment. She bid him to climb to the top of Tepeyac and pick up, a, pick up a variety of flowers that he would find there and bring them to her. So Juan Diego climbed Tepeyac and he was marveled at the Castilian flowers in the middle of winter. So she helped arrange the flowers in his tilma and, and wrap them up and very excited, he went off to bring this miraculous sign to the bishop. And after waiting a long time to see the bishop, this is what happened. Y bien. Forgive me for not believing you.
And as he unwrapped his tomo, Our Lady's miraculous image appeared on it. This is the miraculous image that the bishop saw. Behold, the miracle of Tepeyac. But the miracle was only beginning. A Franciscan friar wrote that within the next six years, they baptized nine million natives. The bishop himself confirmed about 400,000 he wrote in a letter to the king. And that's more than 4,000 4, people baptized every day. Now that was a huge miracle, a game changer. In fact, the whole story of Guadalupe is a perfect model for the new evangelization that is relational, that is enculturated, that is Christocentric, and that is ecclesial. Now Juan Diego's tilma is made of fibers from from maguey plant, it's a like vegetable plant that, that should have decomposed after a few decades, yet the tilma has lasted 489 years. That's a miracle in itself. And equally incredible is that through digital imaging, scientists have found that in both of her eyes can be seen the reflection of several persons from that moment. Now the tilma actually communicated the gospel to the Aztecs in a language that they could understand. In fact, the whole story of Guadalupe is a perfect, it, 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 they didn't have an alphabet. So Our Lady of Guadalupe is like a pictorial image, a pictorial message of the gospel, perfectly adapted to their culture. The Aztecs could literally read the image like a letter from God. Now, the first thing that they would have noticed is that she was standing on top of the moon and in front of the sun and dressed in a blue-green mantle with 46 stars. And it meant that she was a woman of great, great importance, greater than their pagan gods. Yet she herself was not God because her head is bowed in humble respect and her hands in prayer. They also noticed Our Lady's hair. In their culture, only the virgins wore their hair straight down without any braiding. So Our Lady's hair told them of her virginity. But this woman was pregnant and was about to give birth. And how did they read that she was pregnant? Because she was wearing a black sash high up around her belly, something only the indigenous pregnant women wore. So there are now, now, there are 70 flowers on Our Lady's tunic, yet there is one flower that is different from all the others. This unique four-petaled four -petaled flower right before you, the smallest of all the flowers on the tilma, is the most important one because it symbolized the sun, God himself. And it is located right over her womb. And the light bulb turned on for and they realized that this virgin woman was about to give birth to the sun. And her son is the true God, the only God, the creator of the stars and the moon and the earth and the sky. But they also noticed that she was wearing a small cross around her neck. And they realized that they didn't have to offer human sacrifices to her son. Why? Because her son had offered his life as a sacrifice once and for all on the cross for them. And they rejoiced. Final point. Juan Diego, speaking eagle, is represented at her feet with wings. He became her spokesperson about the miracle of Tepeyac. I sense that Our Lady is inviting you to also be her spokesperson spokesperson for the great miracle of Tepeyac. And so I invite you to please, to, to please lift your hands up, maybe like this, if you can lift up, you know, like if you're holding something, we're going to offer it to Our Lady. And I invite you now to, to in, I invite you to place your heart in her hands and sort of lift up your hands like this. And she in turn may offer your heart to Jesus, her son, the King of Kings. And permit me to lead you in a little prayer. Virgen de Guadalupe, Virgin of Guadalupe, my mother, receive my heart and present it to Christ, your son, that he may heal and console my heart 
that he may strengthen my heart for the glory of the blessed Trinity. And together I invite you to pray with me. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Que viva la Virgen de Guadalupe. Que viva. Que viva Juan Diego. Que viva. Que viva Jesucristo. Que viva. Thank you very much for your attention.